Number one, I'm from New Jersey, so no making fun of the accent. And uh, sometimes when I get going, I start talking fast. If I pull a Jersey talking fast thing, just go, Jersey girl, we're in Michigan now. And I'll be good with that. And uh, this is what somebody looks like uh, eight days post-op of having a subpectoral implant of an ICD replaced. So you wimps that think that you get to sit around for like two weeks recovering from surgery, get on a plane and go someplace. OK. So I changed my talk. Because you're going to hear from some physicians today. You're going to hear from other people about some perspectives and some science and some numbers. I'm going to be real bottom line here, and I'm going to say I've been at this 16 years. I've been living with HCM since I'm 12. You read my bio and get all that nasty background. But working with the HCMA since 1996, working with international physicians, national physicians, school districts, families, you name it, to try to figure out what works. What can we do to really change things? And I'm going to try in about 12 or 13 slides to make a pretty compelling argument that this is a problem <laughs> and that we have pretty simple cost-effective solutions. What I want you to walk away from my part of the evening with is the knowledge that HCM is common. It's a genetic disorder often running in families. There are signs, there are symptoms, there are therapies. If we can work better to identify people, they have a real chance of living long, meaningful lives. It's not very expensive to make the changes that we're looking at. We're going to hear a lot over the next, you know, what, 24 months or 12 months in the election cycle of how we don't have any money and we shouldn't be spending more money. No, we should be smarter about how we spend our money. We should be logical about where we're putting our resources. And I have some pretty logical explanations as to what we can do. And the last thing is that HCM, as well as other causes of sudden cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death, are genetic and th should be thought of as familial issues, not an issue of a child or a student athlete, but of that child, the athlete, and their families. And finding one finds a lot more. So put that in the back of your mind, and now I'm going to build my argument in just a few slides, and I hope it works because you guys are my like beta test. <laughs> so it's a five point plan. By the end of my talk, I'm gonna fill in these five points with steps. Admittedly, step five is one of my pipe dreams and I'll settle with getting four of the five, but a girl can dream, can't she? So let's make the argument. According to the Center for Disease Control database, it's the Wonder database. Unfortunately, this is of death certificates. We know that about 1,600 people a year in the United States die with HCM on their death certificate. Unfortunately, we're also pretty well aware, if you've been involved with death certificates, that the material or the data on that certificate is not always 100% accurate. We don't really always know the cause of death because we really don't have great postmortems. So let's figure that the bottom end of this spectrum called HCM and the top end are probably not exactly accurate, but the middle's probably accurate and an underestimation of what's really going on out there. So we see this curve, and it's not in the young athlete or the young person defined as school age, it's in the school age and their parents, which is not what you're seeing in the media. You're seeing the young kid, you're not seeing their parent, but more oftentimes you're gonna see somebody in their 30s and 40s passing away unexpectedly. But strikingly, 54% of the deaths that are reported to be related to HCM are in people under the age of 54. When you look at almost any other disease, you'll see the death curve start to go up at 54, not go down in, to in terms of total numbers. And we're actually not surviving as long as we should and could be if we were identified appropriately. So you've heard the myth that HCM is the leading cause of sudden death in athletes. Well, no, that's not a myth. The myth is that the athlete is the issue. HCM is a leading cause of sudden cardiac arrest in those under 40. 
when you look at the athletic population, there's about 75 children per year that will die during athletic competition, children and young adults up to about 24. And we know this because of the excellent work of Dr. Barry Marin and the Sudden Death and Athletes Registry. We know that about 40% of those deaths are HCM. That's a big number. But think back to those few slides. If you look at the total number of those who die under the age of 24, you've got about 150 kids a year. Only 20% of them are athletes. So we shouldn't be looking at athletes. We should be looking at all young people. We think our children are very important. We think their eyesight is important. We test that. We think other things are important. We test that. We vaccinate. But we're ignoring their hearts. And time has ended for that. I think if you're in this room, you probably can agree with that statement. The question is, how do you do it? So I think the first thing you really have to start with is understanding signs and symptoms of HCM and other forms of diseases that can cause sudden death, the shortness of breath issue, dizziness, palpitations, fatigue, fainting, nearly fainting, chest pain or discomfort, and in your athletes, marked change in performance from one season to next. These are telltale signs of HCM. There's a lot of little things that we could get into, and if I had about an hour and a half to talk on HCM and symptoms, we would talk about how HCM patients get more symptomatic after a meal, and they don't understand why until they get diagnosed, and silly little things like that that we with HCM know about. But here's the interesting wake-up moment. We interviewed and surveyed about 1,600 patients with HCM, and we said, before you found out you had HCM, did the doctor tell you something else other than HCM was responsible for the symptom that you reported? And 19% had been told that they had some form of asthma, most likely athletically induced asthma, because when they ran, they got short of breath and their peers didn't. So it was assumed that they had asthma. No pulmonary function test, no cardiac testing, just a conversation with a doctor that says, I get short of breath with exercise, Here's an inhaler. What's in that inhaler? Albuterol. Think of albuterol and an HCM heart. Great combination. Not. Mitral valve prolapse, well, at least I got to a cardiologist. Maybe somebody who thought they saw something, and maybe the mitral valve is abnormal, but most people with HCM have abnormal mitral valves. Panic or anxiety attacks. This one happens more frequently with girls and women because if we say we feel our heart racing, we're told it's our hormones, or we're just anxious and have a Xanax and have a nice day. You guys walk into the doctor's office and say, my heart's racing funny, you get the full cardiac workup. We get a pat on the back. That's just the way it is. Depression, which is kind of interesting because we can't quite tease this one out yet, but 17% of our population were told that they were depressed. A lot of them didn't want to get out of their chair and move because they didn't feel good. So they just sat there and said, I'd rather not, and that was deemed depression. And 51% were told that they had an innocent murmur. I don't really like the term innocent murmur. I like inconsequential, but let's find out why it's there first before we go labeling it as innocent. 51% of these people were told it was innocent. It was hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I don't think that's so innocent. So we need to have people understand that these diagnoses have to be looked at very carefully and looked at with the family history. And if you have a multitude of these issues, specifically murmur and asthma, that's the big wake up call. I, probably somewhere around 10 or 12% of these people were in both of those classes. So that's, that's pretty high. So how do we find them? Actionable items, things that can be done, primary prevention. For athletes or all children, we have a document similar to what's, what's in your risk is, or your uh, pre-performance uh, participation form for the state of Michigan now, but our form is created a little bit differently and there's a couple questions on here that are omitted from every form in the country right now and we're gonna try to get them implemented in all of them for the athletes, but we want this to be used for all children and specifically at grades two, eight, and 10. This is a sudden cardiac arrest risk assessment form. The difference between this form and what's on the PPE document is the language that is used so that parents understand what's being asked of them 
and are more likely to give a response that is helpful to the clinician. It's not a yes or no, it's a yes, no, we're unsure. And we add in a couple of other items that are not addressed in other documents, including is the child adopted or a product of egg or sperm donation? This is a growing population, and you have a complete genetic unknown in these children for the majority of cases, and there is documentation that sperm donors have been known to um, have HCM diagnosed 20 years after their donation, and in this one case, 22 children were created with this donation, so 11 of them are gene positive. So there's a lot of this going on out there, and you need to be aware of these issues. Why do I think this form is where, where we need to go and have it distributed to every school child? It's one directional. It goes home. It doesn't come back to the school. The parent does not have to report their own health history back to the school nurse or to the school. If they answer yes or unsure to anything, it informs them to turn the form over. On the back of the form, there's three steps to follow. Have a conversation with your health care provider to request a cardiac consultation, and here are the tests that you want to talk about. And three, communicate this information to the rest of your family. And then the steps are explained as to what the tests are, that they're not painful, and that there are treatments and remedies available, and that they shouldn't be afraid to know, and here are some other resources. We would like to see this mandated by state legislatures around the country, and I am currently working with um, a congressman uh, at federal level to draft some national legislation to find a way to get this mandated on a federal level. Obviously, federal legislation takes forever, and if we wait for Washington to act, um, we're going to lose more opportunities on saving people with a very cost-effective form. So we want to start getting it out state by state, and hopefully we can find some champions here in Michigan to get your state legislature moving on this particular piece. So step one of how to solve part of the problem. Now, remember, this does not just look for HCM. This is all forms of sudden cardiac arrest risk. The next piece that we've come up with that again is cost effective, actionable, and real, is what we call drill Dr. Hart. How many of you have participated in a fire drill? Show of hands. How many of your kids in school have to drill for code C or in case somebody with a firearm comes in, my daughter has to do that? So if you look at statistics, your child is more likely to suffer cardiac arrest in school than to die in a fire or to be shot by an invader. But we do nothing to protect for it. What we are seeking is not just to have an AED on the wall, and for districts that can't afford them, or for whatever reason they can't have them, that doesn't mean the child should just be left. You need to enact an emergency action plan. And Drill Dr. Hart was originally formatted for an athletic venue that's where the drill concept came from. Coaches think drills. So we wanted the coaches to drill. But classrooms can do this. Workplaces can do this. Teams can do this. You literally play out the event. We have a, I was going to bring a video of it, but you can go to our website and watch a volleyball team drill Dr. Hart. You, you pick a kid to be your fainter. She faints out. Then you show everybody where to, where to go and what to do. Everybody is involved. You go get the AED. You call 911. You go wait for EMS at the front door. Remember to tell them we're in the back. You go here. You do this. You go get the trainer. Whatever the emergency action plan is for that particular venue, classroom has one. After school activities have another. Churches have another. Everybody has their own emergency action plan. But drill it. Play it. Because people panic. In the state of New Jersey, we lost a boy in a school with an AED because the gym teacher, who was not a coach, so by our state laws, was not required to be CPR certified, literally put his hands up in the air and yelled, don't touch him. The school nurse was across campus. She was just back after having hip replacement. She got across campus with the AED in four minutes. She was about yo tall, and I would guess 55 to 60 years of age. The boy was just about 18, 270 pounds, and had been down for four minutes. Nobody did CPR. Nobody started. Nobody did a thing. 
if we teach people to get in there and start compressions right away, enact the chain of command, or chain of survival, get everybody in action, go get the AED. Most kids know what an AED is, but they're not quite sure where it is in their school. Everybody should know where it is, and they should practice going there and knowing how to get there the fastest way from any particular location, especially gyms. If we drill it, we will teach a generation to take it to their workplace, take it to their dorms, take it outside the school. And when they see somebody go down, they'll be thinking, oh, we have to act. And you have to do this, 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 this. We have to get people to act. So we have one bad case in New Jersey. Three years later, the same thing played out. But this time, it was at a pool during a swim meet. And the concern was, well, what do we do with water? It's electricity. Should we be using this here? Da -da 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 they were wondering while he was dying. That shouldn't happen. We should all be prepared. We should all practice. Fire drill, code C, drill Dr. Hart. It would take minutes a school year. And to train people how to do this, seriously, this is survival, you show them their part in it and how to enact it. It's not that hard, it doesn't cost that much money. So the five-point plan, how are we gonna do this? Well, believe it or not, this is part of step one. Getting out and raising public awareness about SCA, what is HCM, and why it's important to know your family health history. We need people to understand the basics. Step two, require CPR be a prerequisite of high school graduation and get AEDs in all of our schools. I believe that AEDs belong in all of our public venues, and in buildings that are going to have high volume, we should think of them as fire extinguishers. In fact, in, the, in my town, my hometown, we have an ordinance passed now that any new CO, um, Certificate of Occupancy, in our town, where there's going to be over 300 visitors per day, they are required to have an AED. Not a public building. Federal government has to have them in their buildings. Why don't we have to have them other places? So start mandating it, go town by town. Eventually people will catch on that that's just what you do. Step three, have all students complete the sudden cardiac arrest risk assessment form at grades two, eight, and 10. Step four, if any student athlete answers yes to any of the cardiac questions on the PPE, I know the American Heart document says this could trigger a cardiac consult. It shouldn't be could, it should say should. And I've already spoken to the powers that be there and I bet you in the next iteration, it's gonna say should, but I gotta wait a few years for that one. And then the thing that I really want, but I got a big battle here. In the event of a sudden cardiac arrest from unknown causes of a person under 50 where it's suspected that it could be a genetic cause, genetic testing should be done post-mortem and the insurance companies should be paying for this. We've got a program at the HCMA where we provide postmortem genetic analysis for families where it appears to be HCM as cause of death. The knowledge of the genetic mutation in a particular family who has suffered a sudden death may actually be the information needed to save the rest of the family. As if we're able to identify the genetic mutation in the index patient, rather than going through echo EKG, cardiac evaluations every year from 12 to 21, and every five years thereafter, if I find out you don't have the gene, you're free. You're not gonna get HCM. If you do have the gene, we're gonna watch you real careful and make sure that you get the care that you need when you need it. Um, just kind of hard to explain to health insurance companies why they should take this jump. We've had a few pay, um, and we've actually had a few um, coroners pay because they believed it was a public health risk because enough family members were at risk. So it could happen. So in a few slides, and trust me, Darlene and can, or, 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 Shirlene can, can attest to the fact that I could probably talk for about nine hours straight on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and bore the tears out of y'all. My goal here tonight is not to give you this, the, the complex aspects of the disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and all the various things that it can do to you. But I'm here standing in front of you, diagnosed for over 30 years, having lost five family members to this disease, having spoke this week alone to three families who buried people before the age of 35, 
completely unnecessarily. And unfortunately, I probably have spoken to more parents who've lost a child to HCM than anybody else. I don't want to talk to them anymore. I want to talk to them about how to get their kids to the right care. I hope I've made a point that this doesn't have to be ridiculously complicated or expensive, that there are very practical things that we can do starting like now to make it happen. And I hope that you'll join us in this adventure and help us save lives and make tomorrow a little bit brighter for these families. Thank you very much.